Good morning. This is Pamela Jumper Thurman and Barbara Plestad. We represent the OJJDP Tribal Youth TTA Center today for the Indian Country Child Trauma Center. We are presenting uh, frequently asked questions on the community readiness model. Our webinar objectives today are first to provide a brief overview of the community readiness model and second to provide answers to frequently asked questions related to the use of the model. The model was developed at Colorado State University back in 1995 and Barbara Plested and I were on the original development team that included Eugene Edding and Ruth Edwards. The purpose of the community readiness model is to provide communities, tribes, villages, organizations with their stages of readiness for the development of appropriate strategies resulting in efforts that are more successful, cost effective, and sustainable. There are six dimensions for the community readiness model. The first dimension is community efforts, which includes the programs that exist currently, activities, and policies that are already in place. The second dimension is the community knowledge of those efforts. The third dimension looks at leadership, and that includes appointed leaders as well as informal community members who may have a lot of influence in the community. The fourth dimension is community climate. The fifth dimension is community knowledge about the issue. And the sixth dimension are resources for prevention efforts. That includes people, time, money, and space. There are nine stages of the community readiness model, beginning with no awareness, up to denial or resistance, vague awareness, pre-planning, preparation, initiation, stabilization, confirmation, and expansion, and the high level of community ownership. The process for using community readiness is really simple. First, you identify the issue, and then you define what your community might be. That can include a geographic area. It can be a subset of a population or a population. It can be a zip code. But it's up to you to define what that community is. And then you conduct key respondent interviews. You score those interviews to determine the community readiness stages. You then use those scores and conduct a workshop to develop the appropriate strategies that are consistent with the readiness levels. You then implement your action plan and conduct follow-up as the plan progresses. And we decided to do this workshop um, because of questions that have been asked over the years that um, the, the responses might not be in the manual or um, people haven't been able to find them. And just to let people know that in the next revision of our manual, we're actually just going to add um, these questions with the answers in case people uh, want to see them when, when the revision is done in a few months. So we decided to do this presentation on frequently asked questions. Um, and some of these questions actually came up during the TA individual calls with the grantees on this project. So we hope this, hope this information is useful. And so the first question is, um, how do we just abbreviate the community readiness model when we're writing it up um, or talking about it? And so um, what's happened lately, and we're not sure how this came about um, in recent months and over the last year, is that we've seen and heard people um, identifying the model as the CRA. And um, for us, we use the abbreviation CRM for Community Readiness Model. And the reason we do that is CRA, when that's just written that way, uh, we're not sure which um, phase of community readiness that's talking about. Because within the model, there's a flow of it's the overall model, and then there's the assessment phase, which are those interviews that Pam talked about in that process, conducting the interviews. That's the assessment phase. And then there's also the application phase, which is then conducting that workshop and applying those scores to an action plan. So they both start with an A, assessment application. So when it's abbreviated as CRA, it's confusing to know which part of the community readiness model the person is talking about or 
um, discussing in an article. So we recommend that people use CRM. We're conducting the CRM application phase or um, assessment phase or both phases. So I, I think that um, when we hear people talk about CRA, it kind of limits what the model is of, of just an assessment or just an application. It's both assessment and application. So we would recommend you use CRM application phase, CRM assessment phase. And then um, one of the questions that we get is, is it a best practice? And yes, it is a best practice. The uh, First Nations Behavioral Health Association, oh, about 10 years ago, actually um, deemed the community readiness model as a best practice in Indian country, along with um, IHS having it on its website, um, primarily on the suicide prevention website, um, and also, um, as many of, as you know, um, SAMHSA and other funding sources are um, requiring grantees to use the best practice in their application or once they get the grant that they actually have to implement the community readiness model within their community. So yes, it is a best practice. And then can more than one issue um, be addressed during the community readiness interview? And that would be the assessment phase. And um, for a lot of people, this comes up because of grant announcements primarily that talk about uh, in their application that they want the grantee to address, and I'll just give an example, uh, youth violence and bullying. And so in the community readiness assessment, do you ask both about, at the same time, youth bullying and violence? And our response is no, because it becomes very cumbersome, because it's two very distinct issues, and the person you're interviewing gets confused and overwhelmed with, well, do you want me to answer that about bullying? Because there, there's not a lot of bullying, but there's a great deal of violence going on within our youth. So we recommend um, always be issue specific. And I'll, I'll give you an example. So um, in some of our communities, they want to use youth issues. And that covers such a broad range of, of topics. So instead of that, a community might just want to use juvenile delinquency. Um, some communities want to look at substance abuse. Well, with substance abuse comes a variety of drugs, from alcohol to heroin. So to be specific, which substance are you talking about? Alcohol, heroin, marijuana, um, whatever the issue is within your community. Um, and being issue specific, because in, in many communities, just as an example, it may be that um, marijuana use is less of a concern right now than heroin or methamphetamine. So you want to be issue specific so that you know what the level of readiness is for that specific drug um, because substance abuse becomes too overwhelming. Again, the people will ask you, well, if you're talking about heroin, right now it's coming into our community, it's a huge concern. If you're talking about marijuana, right now it doesn't seem to be on the radar. So to be very issue specific with that. And then um, another question that we get is that um, can the community readiness interview questions be changed? And they certainly can be adapted for your community. There may be terms um, or phrases in there that are not appropriate um, to the community that you're working with. And, and I'll give you one example. So if you're working on an issue, especially within juvenile delinquency, uh, related to um, law enforcement, let's say, and you want to know about the current laws, the questions in that section really relate to policy. Uh, that's the word that's used. And you may want to change that and adapt that to laws. And that's, that's fine because that's more issue specific for that topic. People will understand are there laws instead of policies related to juvenile delinquency. Or you could use both. Are there any policies or laws related to whatever that issue is? What we recommend, though, is if you do change, adapt any of the questions, um, that you pilot test those, at least with one or two people, and those can be within your organization, just to make sure that the questions flow and that they're able to answer the question that you revised. Um, within the um, uh, interview itself, uh, one of the questions we get is, how do we use those scores uh, that are given during the interview question, which there's uh, three questions that end with, uh, or that state on a scale of one to 10 how much of a priority is youth delinquency within your community, the prevention of youth delinquency within your community. And the reason um, 
those really aren't used in the scoring. So someone might say it's a 10, um, but when we get to the scoring, they, that, that whole section may score a 6. The reason we ask those questions, and that very first one is the question we ask, is really just to open up the conversation and the interview where people can start thinking and, okay, we're talking about youth delinquency and how do I, how do I see this in our community? I think it's a 10, um, yes, and we have them explain it. Now, their response of a 10 may be exactly where they score on that from their other responses. Um, so sometimes it's, it's actually the score, but we don't use just that score for that dimension. Again, it's just to open up the conversation. And then um, do we use um, the same it people to interview on the post um, assessment? So on the post assessment, which we recommend is done at a year to 18 months, um, once we've done those pre-interview uh, interviews, do we need to interview the same people? I'm sorry, I skipped a question. The next question is how many people do we interview? I apologize. Um, the, it used to be within our um, model that we, um, from research and ethnographic research, um, the standard number was six to interview for ethnographic, where you really start hearing the same responses to questions, and so you get a good feel for the community. Um, in recent, actually within the last year, some new uh, research has come out that at least eight need to be done. So we are going to go, we have now adapted our uh, manual to address that and to indicate that eight interviews need to be conducted. Um, but what we have found over the years of 20 some years using this model is that if we randomly select six interviews from as many as 40 that we've done in communities to 60, if we randomly select multiple times, we still come up with the same levels of readiness for each dimension. However, because research now has changed that, uh, we want to uh, stick and make sure that we're following the protocol of research that we now recommend that eight interviews be conducted. And then since the interviews um, are done with people that are in the field do, of focus, so for example, if your topic is youth juvenile delinquency and we're interviewing probation officers and people that work within correctional facilities, uh, police, um, is that kind of biasing the results because they kind of know? And, and really the answer is, is no, that we have um, interviewed people that work in the field um, and, you know, many times, you know, their responses, they, they do know about kind of what's going on, um, but many times, with, even within the field, we get responses from those individuals of, well, you know, I really don't know, I'm, I'm not sure of other services that are available, or I don't know the actual stats, um, I probably need to look that up. So the results really don't bias or give you a higher level of readiness, because Part of, part of the whole process is to interview people across multiple uh, components of the community. So you would also be interviewing community members at large and, and people outside of that. But it does not bias the results at all. It hasn't in, the, in, uh, in any of the work that we've done. And then do we um, have to ask all the questions that are on the interview? Question, on the interview? And w we recommend that you do. We always do. Um, and this question comes up when you get an individual that you're interviewing who really does respond, you know, I don't know, we don't have any of those services, because the next question may be, you know, what are the strengths of those services, what are the weaknesses, um, that they really don't, um, um, it seems like we shouldn't be asking them because it's not uh, appropriate because they've told us that either they don't know or they don't have any. However, um, I do um, want to say that what that, does and why we continue to ask those questions, because they can say it's not applicable or doesn't, uh, I have no response, is that sometimes it, it reminds people, um, jogs their memory of, you know, we do have this one program. And so they're really answering the question, kind of following the original question of what efforts do you have when you talk about strengths or weaknesses of, of those efforts. So we do ask all the questions because sometimes it jogs people's memories. And then um, can't we use just one scorer? And so when those interviews are completed, uh, what we have found um, is that you really do need to have two people score each of the interviews. And, and the primary reason is because 
if one person may miss something uh, within an interview that was important in the scoring of it. Um, and, and it just gives two eyes on that whole interview process. We recommend that um, people that did not do the interviews themselves actually score the interviews because the person that's done the interviews has really heard all of the responses. And, and sometimes it's hard to remove oneself from, from kind of the overall essence of all the interviews. However, we do understand in small communities that may not be even possible because it's a small staff. Um, and so there may only be two people. And so the, the in person that conducted the interviews is also the scorer. So that just to remember when you're scoring that, you're, you're scoring each individual interview on its own, not all the interviews as one interview. And then, um, what, as, as Pam said in that flow chart, one of the things that um, we always want to make sure is, you know, how many people should we invite to the workshop where we present those scores um, that have been um, uh, scored based on those interviews? How many people do we invite to the workshop? Um, for us, you know, we have done a community readiness workshop with four people, and then we've also done it with over 100 people. For us, the ideal kind of number is 15, 25 people um, at that um, workshop because you get a really good cross-section then of the community so that you have input from all different dimensions uh, that are working either with youth, if the issue is youth suicide or youth delinquency. Um, and you've got really good um, kind of feedback and strategies that address all of the issues. So um, and, and the way that we it, um, actually uh, invite those people to the workshop is that Everyone that we interview, at the end of the interview, we ask them if they would be willing to be contacted uh, once all the interviews are completed, uh, to be contacted to see if they would like to attend a workshop that will address um, the results, talk about the results, and then develop an action plan for the community or the tribe. So those, are all, those individuals mostly always say yes, and so they are contacted. And then the person who's running the project invites other people within the community to attend that workshop. And then should we do the, um, when should we do the post uh, interviews? And I kind of talked about that briefly um, earlier, but we recommend 12 months to 18 months to do a post um, uh, assessment again. And um, the reason we go at least a year out is just so that you can see some change. However, we do know, and we've had some uh, grantees and some programs that because of grant constraints or the ending of a grant, they may need to um, conduct those workshops, or I'm sorry, they may need to conduct those assessments earlier. So we've had groups do it at six months, eight months, 10 months, but you may not see the change in readiness that you would want to see uh, through that process. And then who should we invite to the workshop? Kind of touched on that. But really what you want to do is really get a nice cross-section. So if you're dealing with youth issue on your readiness assessment, to invite youth, um, and it, this depends on your community and tribe on whether you need written parental consent for a youth to attend, but to have youth at the table, to have community members, to have elders at the table. Um, and just a wide cross-section, because really what you want to do is develop a strategic action plan that really fits and kind of covers the entire community. And when you get those people at the table, they will help kind of facilitate that this does run across all of the uh, um, areas of our community. One of the questions that, that we get often, actually, um, from grantees and, and from people using our model is can we audio tape those interviews? And most, most definitely you can audio tape. Um, at the National Center for Community Readiness, where we've conducted now probably 5,000 uh, interviews at least over the last um, really 10 years and probably 15,000 total, um, we have not audio taped. And the only reason we haven't is because we would need written um, consent from the individual that we would be interviewing. And that just la um, adds a layer of kind of cumbersomeness to the whole process. So what we do is, as the person's talking, the person doing the interview is typing their responses. However, if you can get written parental consent and your IRB is okay with that, then audio recording is fine. 
and then can you interview youth? Absolutely. Um, if you're doing a youth project, um, it would make sense to interview youth. Again, it just goes back to if it's um, someone under the age of 18, that you would need written parental consent, though, to interview that, that youth on whatever topic it is that you uh, want to address. And then um, we do get organizations that, uh, and this actually came up on one of the calls for TA uh, with the grantees on this grant, is that can we send emails or can we fax the actual interview question to the, inter to the individual that we want to interview? And we recommend, and we do, we do not send the interview questions ahead of time, and the only reason we don't um, is because what we have found, because we did it, we did it just as a kind of a trial and uh, testing of the instrument, what people tend to do when they have that, the questions in front of them, is that they try to get the right answers. So they may, on the question of, you know, what efforts um, are available in your community, you know, they'll go to a directory or the phone book um, and write down, you know, 18 different programs. And all of the answers are kind of the truth of really what's happening in the community, but it's not their truth. And that's really what we want to know is, what's the community's truth about this issue? So we recommend not sending the interview questions ahead of time to anyone to look at um, or to respond to, um, because you really want to get a sense and a feel for what do people know, believe uh, within the community about this issue. And this is a big one, this next question of, you know, do we present one overall score or the dimension scores to the community? And in, again, in recent, in the, about the last year, um, we've had communities that, are, that have used the model and um, are just using the overall average score. So what they're doing is taking all six dimension scores, because you have a score for um, what has Pam had talked about, community efforts. So what's currently available, knowledge of efforts, leadership, climate, um, knowledge um, of the uh, issue, and then resources. So they're taking those six dimension scores and adding them and dividing by six and coming up, coming up with an average score. And that's what they're presenting uh, to their community, and that's what they're working with in establishing their strategies. However, that is not what should happen. What you want to present to the community are the dimension scores. And, and I'll give you a reason why, and the, the main reason why. You may have, uh, for community efforts, which is dimension A, you may have a seven. Because what the individuals talked about is there's programs running. They've been running for over you know, four years, um, well-established. So they're stabilizer. It's stabilization. But you may have leadership um, that may be at vague awareness about the issue. So they scored a three. So if you add up all those dimensions, and you may come up with an average score of 5.2, let's say, of all those six dimensions, if you use that score to set strategies, you're going to be setting strategies that are appropriate for stage five. And there's examples in the manual of what those strategies should look like. So for uh, leadership that scored in the threes, you're using strategies from five. And so you're way ahead of the game for leaders. You're doing things that won't work with them yet. So um, we recommend do not add and use those average scores because it's not useful in the setting up of the strategies. And then um, we do get requests all the time by email asking permission to actually use the model. And you don't need permission uh, to use the model. It's in public domain. And that was the whole point of um, really the development of the model, was to have a useful, free tool to communities, tribes, and organizations that want to really look at what's our readiness level within, the com within our community on these dimensions. And so it is free. Um, and you can use it. You know, the only, the only requirement is just if you do use it that um, you actually cite where the model came from um, and that it was developed at Colorado State University. And then the next question, <clears throat> when and where should we um, share those community readiness scores? So when the workshop is set prior to um, either us coming into the community to do a workshop 
or if the community is going to be conducting their own workshop, which happens more than us going into a community. We recommend that those scores really not be shared either in writing or verbally um, outside of the group that's conducted those interviews because there's no groundwork for what the community readiness model is and what those questions we're getting at. So at the workshop, prior to them being presented, and this is all in the manual, we always do a presentation, and it doesn't have to be long, just brief, about what the model is, um, that we're actually getting the, what we, we understand and what we want to know is the community's truth about the issue. And it may not be the truth, it may not really be what's happening, but if our community believes this and, and is saying this consistently, that's where we need to set our strategies at. So, and I'll give you an example. So when we uh, look at uh, efforts in the community, we may only hear from all eight people two programs that are available to youth related to youth delinquency prevention. So, um, and that they've only been running for two years. So when we go into the community to present those scores, they may be at a six based on the truth of the people that we were interviewing and the community. But when we go to the workshop, there's actually people from 10 different organizations providing prevention activities. So if, and, and the truth is they may be at a seven or an eight, but the community didn't even recognize or um, didn't know the names of those other eight groups that were sitting in the room. Well, that tells a lot to those service providers that maybe they need to do a little bit more work, and this would be in the strategic plan. Why doesn't the community know about eight programs available in our community? Maybe we need to do better outreach. Maybe we need to do better information dissemination about what we can provide. So if you go into a community and share those scores prior to here's what the community readiness is, model is telling us, People can get a little upset that oh, we're not at a six or our leaders aren't at a three. They're very involved. But the community's truth is, is what the scores have to say. So we always want to set that groundwork of here's the model and then here's the scores and not just we're going to publicize the scores prior to any understanding. Okay. And then... Um, in the manual, um, if any of you have, have looked at that, there are strategies listed under each stage of readiness. And um, what, those are just examples. And so people want to know, can, can, can we only use those that are listed? Well, n absolutely not, because really, you know, the lists are endless and, and very specific to each community. So when you look at the strategies under, you know, um, deme uh, under um, stage three, for example, it's just kind of a guideline of intensity and what we should be doing. You can add to that list. So if you score a three, you know that it's probably not the time to have some large community event related to the issue, um, calling it, you know, uh, reducing juvenile delinquency, because really the community, that stage of readiness is at a three, vague awareness. No one's probably going to be, very few people are going to be coming to that uh, workshop presentation community event um, besides possibly the leader of the, uh, um, the group that's actually putting on the event and maybe people that work for that uh, organization. So to really think about, you know, if we're at a three, these are the types of things we, do, we can do, but, but in our community, what would that look like? So to always tailor those to the community. And then what other options do we have uh, for a workshop? So what we have found sometimes in a community when the scores are really kind of within that one, two, and three, so at no awareness, denial, and vague awareness, um, really what that's telling you is it may not even be if, if all of the dimension scores score within those, uh, uh, within those areas. It's difficult to even get people to come to a workshop to develop a strategic action plan. And so what we have done in those situations that we've worked with a person that has um, asked us to come into the community to do the assessment, um, and we work with uh, that lead person and possibly a few of their staff people to really talk about what can they do at those lower levels just themselves 
to get the community at a little bit higher level of readiness so that a community workshop can actually take place. Um, because we've had communities do those workshops, and again, who shows up is the lead person and really just staff. So there's options to the workshop uh, within a community that scores kind of at those lower levels of readiness. And then how long is a workshop? Um, you know, we have done two-day workshops, we've done day workshops, and we've done half-day workshops. So really, this really has to do with what's appropriate for your community, um, how, how long can you get people to actually come to a workshop, and people running programs really do have a good sense of, I think we can do a day-long workshop, I think we're good with that, or we can do a two-day. So um, that's really the, the best um, option for you is to really look at the community and what, what's really going to work uh, for us. Um, but if we did do a day-long workshop, what, what we do is kind of the morning part, we do an overview of the model to set the tone. We actually have participants interview one another um, just as an exercise to see how that process works. And then we score an interview with them so that they understand how we scored an interview. And then in the afternoon, we um, discuss the scores. We go over strengths and resources and concerns they have related to the issue. And then we uh, use their scores to help them develop a community readiness action plan or strategic plan. So that's kind of our day-long workshop. If, we, if we're going to be doing a half day, what we recommend is just a very brief overview of the model and then presenting the scores and then developing the plan. But always the outcome of the workshop is always to develop a plan based on the readiness scores. And then um, in, in recent years, this has um, actually been a requirement, but a question we, we get often is, can we use the scores in the strategic plan in a grant application? And most definitely. Um, you know, as I spoke earlier, many grant, many grant funders now are requiring the community readiness model assessment and application phase be part of your grant application. However, even if it's not discussed in the grant application, we've had many communities use their scores and strategic action plan as part of their grant um, and have been funded by using that. And really what it does is it tells the funder, these, this is where we're at as a community, and based on that, these are the strategies that we're selecting from the grant application that you said we have to do. That's why we're selecting these, because it fits within our stage of readiness. So um, we believe it's a really good idea if you have if you've used the model and have a strategic plan to actually use that in grant applications that you're going for. And then um, a question that we get often is, you know, since we're going to be talking to people on the phone, can we add any questions to the interview um, part of the community readiness model? And absolutely, we have many grantees that, you know, the questions that, that, are, that have to be asked to get scores are there, but can we add maybe some questions at the end that we really want to see how the community feels about or, or wants within the community? We recommend that you, know, you don't add any more than maybe five questions, but that's really up to the community uh, to whatever, you know, whatever information is needed. Those questions obviously are not used for scoring, but they're great information for the community to have related to the issue to help them build either their strategic action plan or to really just look at more information that they wanted from the community. If you need additional information on a community readiness model, it's possible to view the two webinars that were previously recorded for the TTA Center. And those particular webinars will address interviewing, in-depth, scoring in-depth, and action planning. We want to thank you for your attention to this workshop today. We want to thank the technical assistance support that we always have so wonderfully. And we want to end with the great law of the Six Nations Iroquois Confederacy, which states in our every deliberation, we must consider the impact of our decisions on the next seven, seven generations. And certainly we do. Thank you very much.